Welcome to Mandy the ABA and Aditi the OT's podcast. We are two women across two time zones from two cultures, two allied health fields offering two very different perspectives, yet with a common goal of breaking down barriers and creating breakthroughs to promote interprofessional collaboration. Hello, everyone. Episode 10. I can't even believe we're talking about episode 10. Boom. <laughs> we're into double digits. So, so we're going to talk about the big six. This is, I'm so excited about this because when I first learned about it as an OT, I was clueless, first of all. I was like, what on earth is this? But once I realized the profound impact it could have on interventions and progress with students in fine motor skills, I was I was hooked. So I'm really excited about talking about fluency and fine motor skills and such a brilliant episode. We have informative videos to showcase the big six plus six in our Facebook group. You won't want to miss that. Mandy's got some lovely videos that we're going to talk about, picking up the pencil that she mentioned last time, and then some of the component skills of the big six. Case study, we're going to continue with Sam, our lovely nine-year-old client who just keeps on giving us some brilliant ideas to talk about. He has autism, did have some aggressive behaviours that were somewhat ameliorated when OT and ABA came together. And we are now working on fine motor development using some OT assessment data that was taken and some ABA data. So today our aim is to look at Sam's fine motor abilities. You know, we sort of talked about those individual component skills, but we're going to look at ADLs. And before we get to ADLs, what sort of fine motor skills does he need to build? We're going to share our unique perspectives, discuss our contentions, and then of course, always come together to see how we can help Sam become more purposeful in his environment. And as we talk about all this, we're going to talk about what worked, but we're also going to talk about what didn't work with Sam. So Mandy, give us a shout out for this week. So this week's shout out actually Aditi came from uh, one of the shares that you had on Facebook and we want to send a shout out to Abigail Corkin. I have been delving through the archives of the Precision Teaching Journal this week looking for some a different article, but I came across one of her articles on measuring and charting inner behavior. And perhaps one of the views that many people have outside of our field of behavior analysts is that we ignore anything that occurs beneath the skin. Agree. And Abigail Yes, and that is absolutely not the truth. Abigail is a highly accomplished behavior analyst and a successful businesswoman, author, someone that I would love to meet one day. I've heard so much about if we ever get back to precision teaching conferences again. In her 1977 article, she underwent recording her own positive and negative thoughts, some of which evoked emotion and others that were merely thoughts really recommend it uh, you look back to that paper and actually all of her work that she's done on inner behavior and as I said this is something that most critics of behavior analysts think that we don't measure and would be surprised by that there is a possibility to measure and therefore intervene and develop interventions to address such things as using negative statements about yourself how to reduce those and increase positive statements and also evoking emotion around the use of positive statements and how to become highly aware of our own inner talk to ourselves so Abigail has her own website with lots of resources at www www.abigailbcorkin.com I think a lot about how we teach in a talk as my own daughter with severe autism I wish she had more of that <laughs> I wish she could talk less out loud and more in her head. <laughs> and I never thought I would say that because, of course, well, she couldn't form words. Yeah. But now I'm like, say it in your head. And so, actually, I, I have brainstormed some really, really good ideas this week on how to evoke in her getting her own imagery without constantly having to share that. Mm. The great thing about the standard celebration chart is that you can develop these interventions and assess their effectiveness. And that's what Abigail did with her own behavior. And it's very, very interesting. That article, I'll share that in our show notes. Um, so stay tuned for an upcoming episode two on how to measure almost anything using the standard celebration chart. Thank you so much, Abigail, for such amazing work. Lovely. So quick clarification, Mandy, for us OTs out mm. there. So this inner thoughts is that I understand that precision teachers in ABA do measure that. Do ABAs in general consider inner thoughts too? Yes. Yeah. In general, I mean, there is a, I guess, 
perhaps going back many decades, uh, there were some behaviorists that thought that if you couldn't see it, you know, you couldn't measure it. But that's right. that's not how um, behavior analysts uh, think these days and the development of acceptance and commitment therapy is that sits under the ABA banner Mm -hmm. is a testament to that for anyone that knows anything about teaching mindfulness and how to change the way you think and how to deal with stresses that comes up in your life very much evidence of the fact that we care very deeply about what occurs underneath the skin and thank you for clarifying because you know I I thought about that I'm like oh some people do still believe that that ABA is all about if you can't see it can't measure it, can't do anything about it. So thank you for that. But let's recap and talk about my favorite friend, Sam. Remind us, Mandy, where were we? We did an assessment. We took some OT data for the assessment and you did some ABA assessments. And um, there were lots of things that didn't work, right? What were they? Well, I think, I guess what mostly hadn't worked was a lot of the work that he'd done previous to coming to us on ADLs, so teaching things like dressing and feeding and shoe tying. And I remember the first session that he came to with me, I looked down, he had these little plastic, I don't know what you would call those, but things to keep his shoes on so that he couldn't untie them and throw them off. Thanks. So there had been a lot of a Make sure you uh, thank, thank the OT. OT for that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's right. The, there had been accommodations to assist him with certain. Actually, I wouldn't say that's assisting; that's preventing him from removing his shoes. But in general, I would say because, and I found this too, is that one of my early goals. His mum said, "Please, please, can you teach him to tie his shoes?" And so the first time I asked him, you know, I started to assess that and look at what he could and couldn't do, like take baseline measure. You know, he threw that shoe across the clinic, but I really realized later that you know he had uh, much of his behavior around teaching ADLs had come about because it was so difficult and um, you know I gosh I have some experience of this myself I am you know trying to improve my skills as a track and field athlete and in particular as a sprinter and some of those things are so difficult that I you know I, I really get in touch with how a learner feels when you have high rates of failure at something and you do almost anything to avoid practicing those skills that are too hard for you so I had discovered too what hadn't worked was just working on the skill itself when his hand strength and his ability to manipulate his fingers was so poor Mm. no definitely so you know in that context I think that there's a lot of work refusal and you know those sort of things did you see that with Sam too yeah and of course there was you know what maintained that behavior was getting out of the the having to do it Mm, that's the first thing so escape from the demand because you know I mean until you start to teach someone that can't tie their shoes you just can't believe how difficult a skill that is for kids that don't have fine motor skills it's incredibly complex like the manipulation of the laces and the tying and the how tight you have to tie things the looping of those laces wow you know it's quite amazing that any of us ever learned to do that right But there's a lot of component skills in there. So, you know, of course, when he was throwing shoes, you know, outside of the cubby and things, he got out of doing that. Mm -hmm. But also what conditioned up in the process is it's actually, I imagine, not that I've been that person, but actually quite fun watching people, you know, duck and dive from the items that you throw. <laughs> yes, you and there have, was a lot of You've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I guess in jest, you know, I've thrown, you know, paper at people, paper balls at people and stuff. It's quite fun to watch people duck and dive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people, people were very scared of this beautiful little boy oh, okay. um, because he can inflict quite a lot of damage. And um, so people were tiptoeing around him, not putting too many demands on him. And he was, you know, life was pretty easy for him, but there was a lot of things he couldn't do. So, sure. you know, it, What we did was we took baseline data on many of the component skills that look at hand strength and your ability to successfully engage in things like buttoning and shoe tying and and, uh, feeding yourself, etc. So when I think about fine motor skills, at least in OT, and I think in ABA too, we both use chaining procedures, right, to teach fine motor skills and functionality. However, I did read some research uh, that suggests that chaining procedures are not likely to be effective 
if they don't have an accuracy and speed component, right? I think it was a study by McManus in 2001. I'm sure there are more studies since then, where he found that the students weren't able to maintain these skills for long periods of time because it, there was no, you know, fluency, I guess, component to it. So in yeah, OT, because many, that's right. That's right. Because many of these skills that you're teaching might only occur once a day. Right. Like you're only going to button your shirt once a day, or you're only going to practice that once a day. And in order to get really good at it, you have to do it a lot more than that. And that's where fluency brings in. Okay. How quickly do you want the end goal to be? If you want to button your shirt within a certain period of time, you right. need to be able to do it quickly. And so, yeah, so fluency is a really important component to ADLs. So for OTs out there, you you know, I mean, we certainly focus on practice, but it's typically once a week. You know, I will work with Johnny, we'll do buttoning, but if you don't have a home program, you're missing a huge component. So that's why, as Mandy said, fluency is so important, um, not only in the practice element, but accuracy and speed. So summarize for us again what slu- fluency is. I know you talked about it in the last one episode, but just a little reminder. Yeah, I did. I referred to Carl Binder's paper, Behavior Influency, and that is in our show notes from episode nine, where he talked about the common meaning of fluency that most people would be familiar with is like automatic, effortless, doing it without hesitation, without strain. And if there's anything that you have learned to do before that's super easy for you, then you would say that you're fluent at that. And so most of us at least <laughs> who have been driving a car for many, many years can get in and turn on the car and drive it without having to think about all of the components with the in driving and actually that's a really complex skill in itself but also you would have seen other examples of fluency with people that are amazing at playing the piano or the guitar or singing you know they don't have to stop and think about that skill do they have to practice it still yes but they the component skills of that they're fluent at and so it's easy for them to do but the definition that comes from that paper is the fluid combination of accuracy plus speed that characterizes competent performance and so you can just say that fluency is accuracy plus speed in other words you want to do it without pausing and hesitating and you want to do it without making any errors that's fluent performance so you know in ot if we tend to have this sort of top down approach where you know we are trying to practice a skill and then we may have some fluency components that arise from practicing the skill. So this method, you're really flipping that. You're going from a bottom up approach. You're going to start with building fluency in those component skills and then building it up to achieve that grand goal of the functional task or skill that you're looking at. So it really is changing your perspective in OT for sure. For many OTs listening out there, it does take a little different stance on where to start and how to move forward. Yeah, but I feel like there is there's a lot to share because you guys are really creative at thinking of ideas. Like just recently, I, one of the little girls that I had worked with for a long time, she used to, she has a, a lot of behavior around putting, she has to wear a blazer to school and a, a blouse. And I can't even tell you how difficult it was for her to turn over the collar mm-hmm. at the back of both her, her blouse and her blazer. And so do you know what those things are called flip bands? Mm-hmm. Do you know what they are where, yeah. where you slap bands, are yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that turned out to be a really good skill for teaching her to press things out flat with her thumb and she loved it as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes you can get really creative and go, what is the component skill that's making this really hard? What is it that's so easy for me to do? I can do it without thinking. Mm-hmm. What is it that's so difficult for her? Let's take that one thing and train it to fluency and then see if the high level skill gets better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes if you, you talked a little bit about chaining there, Aditi, there is, you know, Behavior analysts will talk about forward chaining and backward chaining mm-hmm. and or also assessing the components and seeing which ones you have and which ones you don't. So it's a matter of saying, okay, what's the whole composite skill? What's the whole skill itself? What are the components of each of those skills? And, you know, in, a, in behavior analysis, we call that a task analysis. Mm-hmm. What happens immediately before the behavior within that skill and after that causes the next step in that behavior, mm-hmm. like an antecedent and a behavior and a consequence within each of those skills? Which parts can the, the learner already do and which parts are difficult? And how can we teach that to fluency? Mm-hmm. And then... Then you can test that skill again at points in time once the components. So you talked about a top-down approach. Sometimes that works because, for instance, you can teach shoe tying. You can start at the beginning of, you know, shoe tying where you, you, you start the laces or you could backward chain it where you just teach the, the very last component of right. the skill or you could 
train to fluency there the little bits in between that are difficult for the learner to engage in so it can be you know a forward or backward or a variety of teaching skills but I really like the way you described it there that if you can't do it without pausing or hesitating or asking for help it's very difficult to ever do it fluently. Right so what sort of uh, fluency targets did you have with Sam? So on intake, we looked at, I really wish that I'd known about your some of your um, hand measuring tools, which I'm now looking to, but from our last episode, but we looked at uh, squeezing different graded balls mm -hmm. to see, and we have an aim for that, which is 200 on the balls that we use, 200 squeezes per minute. We looked at squeezing two different gradings of tweezers, one a whole hand tweezer and then pincer grip tweezers. We looked at the rate of picking up beans uh, using a pincer grip and dropping them in a cup and then doing that with tweezers. We looked at the rate of picking up and putting down pencil that I talked about before and holding and also being able to pivot the pencil in hand. Mm -hmm. So we looked at a lot of different components of both that might be contributing to hand strength and also holding things back. And then finally, I get to it, on top of his handwriting assessment, we looked at the big six plus six skills. And I'll say that. Uh, yes. So did you look at, because when I think about from an OT standpoint, laterality, mm -hmm. so basically that means was he using two hands together fluently? Because that would be something that we would look at. Yeah. So for that, well, we did when we got to, when we started to do shoe time, he couldn't pick up both um, laces at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so we taught left and hand, uh, like opening and closing pincer grip mm -hmm. to fluency using left and ha right hand together. Okay. Because there's, yeah, so sometimes in those skills, you're right, you have to use both hands at the same time. Right. Not very often. Like in handwriting, it's, it's, you know, you're holding the paper and using right. your pencil. But it's rare that you have to use both hands to do the same skill. So I like what you're asking there, but yeah, the first time I saw that is when he went to pick up. He had he was definitely right hand dominant by the time yeah. he had come to us. So that would be it's called bilateral integration when you have to use two hands, right. otherwise it doesn't work. Well, for a lot of ADLs, we require that. But also, yes. do you assess crossing midline? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we well that comes into the big six actually. In, okay. In the way that I teach one of those reach drills, in that we teach to reach across. The body and so should we talk about the big six then? Sure. So these are some skills that uh, were developed within, gosh I don't even know who I can attribute originally to those skills, I, if anybody knows please let us know on the Facebook page but anyway there's been published studies on those now and initially I just knew about the big six which are fine motor skills to assist in ADLs and then there are the plus six which are more gross motor skills to assist you manipulating big objects. So the big six is reach, touch, point, place, grasp, and release. And the plus six are push, pull, shake, squeeze, tap, and twist. So they are basically all of the skills broken down to assist you to manipulate objects, to move your fingers, to be able to do things like ADLs or play with toys or manipulate objects and one of the really exciting things that has occurred with one of the learners that I work with I I'm currently working with a student that is uh, has autism and has an almost at least when he presented to us an almost complete lack of any form of play skills that would allow us to use something as a reward for teaching anyway so we taught by we started by teaching him the big six and all of a sudden, it was so exciting. He started manipulating objects and we were able to teach him cause and effect, wow. which then re reinforced him playing with things like, you know, we had skills like pushing money into a money box and pushing cars down a track and playing with the toaster because he could push the toast in. Mm -hmm. So I wish, maybe I will be able to publish this, but teaching him big six plus six allowed him to start to manipulate objects so that he could learn cause and effect. So it has been amazing what's occurred for him. And now we have all of these toys we can use, maracas and all. He loves those. Uh, we, he actually loves our little tag teach clickers, yeah, yeah. Um, which, he, he, which he couldn't push before. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he got in contact with the cause and effect of 
pushing something and hearing a sound or pushing something and seeing an effect and also being able to push play on the iPad. So these skills showed up very, very quickly in play skills, which was really awesome because then we had something to reward him for other different types of skills. Oh, yeah. And plus it, it, you know, it increases independence and increases exploration, which is a huge component of human occupation. So no, that sounds brilliant. What other aspects did you, well, I guess, what did the baseline measures look like for Sam specifically? So what we found is that there was a lot of errors in amongst Mm. his approximations of those skills that we asked him to do. So, and this is what we know about whatever the opposite to fluency is. Uh, non-fluency <laughs> or not bumping. Dis, disfluency disfluent that's what it is disfluency right is that yeah bumpy is a good way of describing it is that lots of errors show up so for okay. instance we would ask him to do some of these skills mm-hmm. for instance picking up so the way that one of the assessments that we use for assessing your ability to manipulate objects is to put a pile of beans and then reaching into the middle of the beans grabbing one bean like you know those black or right. pinto beans or black black beans and then throwing them in a cup It's a really good test of being able to pick up something, you know, like a pencil and then releasing it. And he would, you know, in the assessment, he would have great difficulty. So each time he went to grab a bean, he wouldn't be able to do it. So that would be an error. So the rate of errors in those component skills was very, very high. And he was, it was very, very slow. So that's what baseline showed us. There was a complete, almost a complete lack of fluency in, in any of these component skills. Oh, right. So if he grabbed more than one, is that an error too? I would also count that as an error because, yeah. Okay. So it's like picking up one bean and throwing it. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's a real skill in reaching into the middle of beans and picking just one, yeah. grasping it with enough enough intensity that also then releasing it. Yeah. And so, you know, that's two right there. That's a number of different um, big skills. It's the sort of you have to reach out for it, then you have to grasp it. That So reach is a one big six skill. Grasp is another and release is another. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was, he was not able to do that easily. Mm. And, of course, that shows up in um, buttoning. Right. It, it shows up in shoe tying. It shows in cutlery, you know, picking up cutlery, grasping it and then releasing it at the right time or, you know, manipulating the object. So, yeah, so well, all of those big sk- six skills were really lacking fluency. Well, actually also incorporate silently somewhat is the ability to squeeze with enough pressure yes. to pick up, which is a huge issue that we see. It's called muscle grading in OT where, you know, they can pick up things, but it's so light or they don't push hard enough. So yeah, that sort of encompasses all that. So what sort of aims did you, um, and did you, you know, base it on published aims or what did you use? So, yeah, so there are, because there's a number of papers, in particular the paper that I want to draw people's attention to, and I really hope I pronounce these names correctly. Sorry if I don't. To Warwick, I believe, a, a Siphon and Eshelman. I'll just call it Eshelman because I know him very well. Uh, so the Eshelman paper 2010 is a paper on the Big Six Plus Six looking at teaching these uh, component skills to fluency to children with autism and then how that impacted ADLs like putting on socks, buttoning and other ADLs without any additional training in that area but just teaching the component skills and so that was the paper on which I drew my aims from but if you search online for aims for big six you'll find they generally lie depending on what teaching materials you use because you have to choose how to teach these skills. Mm-hmm. We have our, we've developed our own materials for each of those skills, but that paper also identifies what they used. So the aims lie somewhere between 80 and 150 per minute. Some of our um, other fine motor skills go up to 200 per minute, but if you do it for a whole minute, your arm nearly drops off. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some of those skills you can only do for short periods of time. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, this is, I guess, some of the clinical knowledge that builds up in the area of precision teaching is how long do you have to do this skill for and maintain it for so that it is mastered and it, it you don't lose it over time? And it's there's a lot of work in the precision teaching field has been done on, for instance, 15-second timings versus 30-second timings versus doing it for a whole minute. So many of these skills you can get very fluent at by practising just 
you know, being able to do them for 15 seconds. Because if you think about if the aim is 200 per minute, that's 50 practices of that skill within 15 seconds. It's a lot of practice, especially if, if the, the rate of error is very, very low versus, for instance, instructing someone to do it, for instance, okay, point, you know, in point this object. So that's a, a good example, I guess, of a skill that I teach. One of the big six skills that I always start with, with our children that are doing early language work and some of the kids some of those kids on the spectrum your ability to point fluently to an object and identify it is critical to every other you know goal that you're going to have within an ABA program so sometimes we'll start with an accommodation Aditi where we have the child hold a block or a lolly or something so so that they can actually (laughs) (laughs) so that you can actually because you know they will have difficulty grasping their hand closed so they can point fluently Mm -hmm. but ordinarily how we teach that skill at least is we will start with is like a large circle with a black dot in the middle so the child knows where they have to place their pointer finger. Mm. Now, if you just say point to the dot, that's one practice. And if that, you know, the first time they do that, that's an error. That's a very little amount of practice to be able to get, okay, point to the dot again. You need that child to be able to, you know, repeat that task over and over again so that it's so easy and effortless that when you say point to bike, point to cat when you're trying to teach receptive language, there's no effort in the formation of the point and the ability to easily identify the item. So we start with one circle and then over time we build up to, you know, six circles actually, three on top and three down the bottom. And we go three, two, one, okay, point. And they have to keep engaging in the task. Sometimes we just start at five seconds and then we build up to 15 seconds. And, you know, within 15 seconds, you know, kids start to be able to do that like 30, 40, 50 times in, in 15 seconds. So they get a lot of practice at being able to point. To so skill. are they saying something with pointing or they're just pointing? No. Okay, just pointing. No, you're just getting to manipulate their um, pointer finger while having their other three fingers grasped right. closed. Because right. okay. many of you who are out there who have taught receptive language will know the frustration when a kid reaches out with their whole hand Mm -hmm. to identify an item but they're not actually pointing at the specific item that says I'm identifying this one right here with my pointer finger Mm -hmm. not my whole hand laying on it and then sometimes you need them you know to identify a component of that picture you need them to be able to identify one very small object within the picture or part of an object and so pointing is so important for so many reasons and also it is the most important skill in terms of I um, drawing people's attention to things in the environment and you know that is joint attention and being able to share something that's of interest to you with somebody else Mm -hmm. and pointing is obviously culturally and a very important skill to be able to say even if you can't talk I see something that's of interest to me that I want to draw your attention to so pointing is such an important skill within our you know within our culture you know so I have a a side question here for you. So I have a client who, who he, he's very good at pointing, um, but he has no awareness of his thumbs. So if I say, if I say, Johnny, uh, show me your thumbs, he has no idea where they are or what they're doing. And this impacts his ability to do ADLs like, you know, scissors, using a pair of scissors because he has no idea, buttoning. So could you use the same concept to increase awareness of his thumbs? Yeah. Is he verbal? He is. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we've talked about before, I'm, I'm sure you've already done this because you're an awesome teacher, is that, you know, we'll often teach the conceptually through language what something is and then we practice that to fluency. So, mm-hmm. you know, the first thing I would teach him, I guess you've already done this, is, you know, okay, we have, you know, four digits and one thumb. These are these are thumbs. Here's the thumb on my right hand. Do what I'm doing. So through every single mm-hmm. learning channel, a C say, uh, a C do. So imitation. Oh, so pause there. Yeah. What's a learning channel? Because OTs probably sorry. Don't know okay, so <laughs> this is a really gosh. With this, you know, if we were selling precision teaching, if we <laughs> this would be the lesson for it. So, you know, one of the really important things that Oglinsley brought to the teaching world is using plain English, and it was one of his you know, I guess beliefs is that 
you know, behavior analysis uses so much complex language and it scares people away. So the awesome thing about precision teaching is it uses plain English and it's really easy to understand. So he, uh, one of the things that we have within precision teaching is what we call learning channels, which is what sensory input is this skill using and what sensory output is it using? If you are reading, that is a C say, assuming it's out loud reading. If you are spelling, it's a hear, do. You know, if you are reading silently, that's, uh, we call that free because it's thinking or a, that's a free think. If you are, what else? If you are, say, imitating, that's a see, do. If you are following an instruction, that's a hear, do. So the learning channel is the sensory input and the sensory output that that skill requires. And I think very frequently people say, oh, he's a very visual learner or he is auditorily strong. So they're talking about that that learning channel is very strong in that learner. It doesn't mean, actually Dr. Behrens has a very good article on this, that, you know, about learning styles, uh, that styles are good for fashion but not in learning. It's, so it's just that a child might be stronger in one learning channel but the other hasn't been trained as, as frequently. And so so that's what a learning channel is. So for skills that you want to be not under the control of somebody's instruction, they are like we call that free do. So all of those big skills are free do. In other words, go ahead and point and keep going until I say stop. And the kid right. keeps pointing. Uh, so it's what we call, because we use the term, it's a free operant. So only it's re- dependent on one instruction to keep engaging in the behavior. And there's lots of behavior that shows up like that in life because you don't want a kid who is needs to button up all the buttons on their shirt to be dependent on you saying, okay, button the button, button the button, right. button the button. You want to say, okay. So that prompt dependency. Exactly. And, yeah, you know, that's, yeah. that's where some precision teachers will, will say, you know, in discrete trial instruction, the learner is constantly prompted to do something in mm-hmm. Free operant instruction or, you know, fluency-based instruction, the instruction is given once or the expectation is raised once and then the learner engages freely in that and it gives them a lot of opportunity for a lot of practice without any prompts. Brilliant. So going back to my client, Johnny, who has no awareness of his thumbs, yes. sorry. <laughs> what would I do? <laughs> Give me some thoughts there. Well, I really feel like I'm telling you how to suck eggs here, Adina, because I'm, I'm sure you've tried these things. But if I had a learner that presented in that way, I would do a mm-hmm. lot of concept instruction around hands and the mm-hmm. the names of the hands and then practice that. So, okay, so what okay. are... And actually, we do this a lot. We have in our program a music literacy program. And in, oh. and, um, and in your program, you have to be highly aware of your hands to be a really good pianist. And so we do a lot of work through identifying, you know, first like thumb, first finger, second finger, third finger, fourth finger, right hand, left hand. And um, mm. I'm just thinking that some of those materials would be super, super useful to you because we have flashcards as well. But also we, st- we start with an oral review and go, okay, we're going to hold up both of our hands. This is my right hand. This is my left hand. Do what I'm doing. Yeah. Hold up your left hand. Hold up your right hand what really good which hand did you hold up which hand am I holding up now I'm holding up my thumb so which am I holding up my thumb can you do that now you can prompt, yeah. prompt it for him if he can't do it am I holding up my thumb yes are you holding up your thumb yes what about now no that's your pointer finger and I would do a lot of concept instruction assisting him to be able to identify that and recognize it in both himself and you as well and then okay. you could do fluency in terms of you know, putting your hands down like you would play the piano. Okay, press your thumb in, press your forefinger in. Which finger am I pressing in? Which, you know, into the table. Right. Do what I'm doing and imi- yeah, imitate. Yeah. And then so that would be the concept instruction. But then, you know, a lot of fluency in terms of, you know, how he has to manipulate his thumb. So thumbs up, thumb down yeah. on right hand That's and left hand. kind of what I did. I didn't yes. do any concept instruction. I did more uh, yeah. thumbs up and down. And then, you know, uh, just to clarify for OTs out there that this, you know, you may think, well, I did teach him how to use scissors. And you may think, well, if he knows how to, he's functional. So does he really need to know this? Well, he does, because again, that generativity is what 
this will bring, where he can do other things that requires them without instruction for that activity. Also, I imagine it makes a difference in handwriting, recognizing your B's and D's, left and right. You know, it can also be a component skill for that. So I can see how it would be really helpful. Yeah, it's also, a, off topic sorry, it's also <laughs> a big component of pincer grip, right? Being able to press with, yeah, with, with your pre- pressure into your thumb. So yeah. So the, but you know, he, interestingly, he knows how to do all that because he was taught the pincer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But he was never taught because there's really not much you do just with your thumb. There's, there's really not much out there. So I think he was never taught that. And so he never, anyway, I'm going down. Yeah, sorry. Hole here. Let's yes, go sure. back to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam, uh, where are we at with Sam now? Okay. So, um, we taught, we still have this, so there's 12 skills in total. And he already had a couple of them that that he was quite good at and I didn't think was any benefit. But we have now, the way that we train them is we train one at a time and once that is, once he hits aim on that, that goes into retention, we still check that like every second day to make sure that he's still hitting those aims. But guess what? What happened was all of those skills started showing up in his shoe tying. Woohoo. And so mm. many of those things have to be used with both in, within shoe tying. It's a left and hand, a left hand, right hand component skill. So we trained the right hand and then we, we checked the left hand. And if the left hand needed additional training, we trained that separately so that when we came, he came to pick up the laces in his shoes, all of a sudden he could do it with his pincer grip because all of those component skills were so much stronger. So, um, yeah, and I guess one of the things that is really cool about training in that way is that if you have identified that this is a component skill of a higher level skill, you can train the lower level skill but check the higher level skill to see if your teaching is showing up in higher level skills, which is exactly what that article is about, is training component skills so that they show up in ADLs. But also what was really, really exciting is that his mum started to share with us that things that he was wasn't able to do before he was attempting to do on his own so he wouldn't pick up a fork with she she was still feeding him at the age of eight all of his food and he was refusing Mm. to pick it up but all of his ability to scoop food to stab food all of those things she noticed that he was much more prepared to engage in it he would never open his school bag but be able to open his school bag before all of a sudden he was getting his own water bottle out. So that's that kind of in the the last episode we talked about RESA, these tests mm-hmm. when we train to fluency what happens. And this is what happens because those component skills are so easy, they start showing up elsewhere. So they started showing up in being able to get his own water bottle out, being able to open his own water bottle without asking for help, being able to get things out of his bag. And also even... I guess one of the most exciting things that happened is he was able to start manipulating a PS4 hand no. <laughs> handset, which I know for most parents out there would go, oh, that's not a good thing. No, that's but brilliant. for us, he could for the first time start to learn gaming and really got in contact with Minecraft on the PS4. Mm. And both left and obviously you have to, it's quite complex, right? You have to use your left and right hand in one of those places, uh, one right. of those handsets. And so all of a sudden we were able to teach him how to build and that really developed a lot of rewards that we could use after that so I just can't rave highly enough about the big six for for component skills of therapy for early learners to teach ADLs and feeding uh, independent feeding and then Mm -hmm. you know all of those things that kids need to be able to manipulate like toys and other objects but all of that stuff started to show up for him well just FYI I'm rubbish at PS4 or any of this. Things. <laughs> so we might it's need to so get you, We might need to put you in a program. <laughs> I know. I think I need the big six. I think we should advertise that. But anyway, that's brilliant <laughs> because what you're really telling me, if I was to summarize it all for the OT audience at least, is that engaging in the fluency building of the big six really enabled Sam to access his environment, engage in his environment, access socialization, yeah, and leisure skills, independent skills. I mean, it's so profound that engaging in this fluency component skills can really change 
you know, how a student engages with their environment. And that is the core essence of OT. What we want is independence for our client to live how they want to live. So I can see how this embeds perfectly into our scope and sequence and scope of practice. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I wanted to add is from a neurological standpoint, when you are practicing something to fluency, it makes a neurological change in the brain. Yes. So we, you know, we read about when you practice something that it's myelinization of those neurons and that enables the transmission to go much faster between neurons and that's what enables you to be fluent at something. And the nice thing about that is once they're built, it doesn't go back. You know, the, the neurons are a lot more myelinated and therefore have the capacity to move faster in transmission of information. So it really, there is a physiological, and I wish we had, I don't know if there's any research on that. Is there, Mandy? Do you know of it? Yeah, there, there is. Perhaps that is a subject for another episode, Aditi, because long-term potentiation and fluency is something that I have talked a lot about to a neurologist. Mm. But also there's that awesome book, and I hope I get this right, by Eric Anderson called Peak Performance. Do you know that book? Uh, yes, so from a neuroscience perspective and, you know, what's occurring neurally when you learn like that. And I know Dr. Kim has collaborated with him. That is a book that anybody who's interested in how somebody became expert at something, Anders Ericsson has a really awesome book. What he uh, learned, I think, from Dr. Kim was what happens when you don't. So, for instance, a lot of people that get really fluent at things is because they're highly motivated to learn. For instance, like people that learn to play the piano or the violin fluently or become elite sports people. He was very used to working with those populations. What I think was able to be shared with him was that, you know, behavior analysis, we're experts in creating motivation for unmotivated people that don't really want to learn how to read or write. They're not, you know, they're not saying, yes, please teach me how to, you know, hand write. They're not really motivated. And that's where, you know, creating a highly, an environment flooded in, in reinforcement and contriving uh, reinforcers by depriving them and making them powerful reinforcers is what, you know, behavior analysts are experts that is creating creating highly motivating instructional environments. So that tells me that if you as an OT have a client who is struggling in a fine motor task and you're struggling engaging them in that task, there are two things you need to do. You need to think about the component skills. Is it just too hard? The second thing to do is seek out an ABA therapist if you have a colleague available to help you find a way to motivate and reinforce that student that perhaps you're missing that component. And with that, let's go into our key takeaways. Mandy, go ahead and tell us a little bit about that. Great. So yeah, this is something to really look into is the big six plus six. And we will share that Eshelman paper with you to look at how uh, they taught those skills and look at fluent performance on component skills when a bigger skill that you're teaching is you're struggling with or not getting any improved performance on. Perfect. Thank you. So we are going to talk about ADLs next episode. Don't, don't miss that. ADLs is going to be brilliant, uh, specifically shoe tying, how Mandy decided to conquer that task with Sam. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit from the OT and ABA perspective and how we can come together and really analyze sh shoe tying because I know both of us work on it. And I've often heard OTs go, well, you know, she got them to, she got Johnny to do it in, a, you know, it's just so quickly and I'm still struggling. So I think this will be a really nice episode. Wonderful. And please do share your fluency stories with us on Facebook. We would love that. And do we have aims, Mandy? I, I wanted yes. to make sure. Yeah. I'm I'm going to put a link in Rick Labina has published some aims on many different skills. He also has a, mm -hmm. has a book that we can refer to that has a lot of published aims in within there. And in that, uh, in the Eshelman paper, there are also aims that they use for Big Six Plus Six. And I will publish the aims that I use on the videos that I'm going to upload there to show you what we use for our own aims for the Big Six Plus Six. Brilliant. And lastly, I wanted to share that I do have a course on my website, dradtheot.com, that goes into all the foundational skills that 
students need for fine motor skill development. It starts with anatomy, physiology a little bit, and then just a developmental sequence of fine motor skills that might be helpful. Also has a few fluency videos, uh, specifically more for OTs who may be interested in how to build fluency into their sessions. So that is available on my website in case anyone is interested. And the exciting news is we will be doing a deeper dive specifically on the big six plex plus six because it's so powerful and profound and every therapist should have knowledge of it so we will uh, share details with you as we move along please do contact us on facebook and share your opinions and thoughts and remember the most valuable resource we have as therapists is each other without collaboration our growth is limited to our own perspectives so hashtag collaboration over competition until next time bye bye from the windy city and hooray from down under